Hello, we're glad to have you with us for this, our Bible class on Sunday, November the 29th. We're in the middle of our study of John's Gospel. If you'd like to turn to John 17, and that's where we'll be. Again, I would remind you we are all online this week, so you can also watch a video of our worship service. We invite you to worship with us that way. Also, the bulletin is online. You can keep up with the latest news and information by checking the bulletin off our website. I hope you'll do that as well. In John chapter 17, Jesus comes to the final, kind of the conclusion of, of all of his teaching ministry. He's been speaking with his disciples. They had that last supper in the upstairs room. They've come out from there and been walking across the Kidron Valley, headed toward the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and as Jesus comes now to the end of that discussion with them, as they walked, he taught. It seems now they're coming right to the edge of the garden. This doesn't seem to be a scene that would uh, fit with walking and talking. Jesus is going to pray. You know, throughout the Gospels, we have lots of mentions of the pray, uh, that Jesus prayed, but not many of his prayers are recorded. And this prayer in John 17 is one of just a handful, and in some cases, some, some have argued this could be called the Lord's Prayer as much as the one that's recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel. It's also often called the High Priestly Prayer. It was first given that name sometime in the 1500s. Jesus is praying, and he prays an intercessory prayer. That is, he prays on behalf of other people. And so as you read this prayer, it gives us lots of insight into how to pray. Jesus is going to very obviously pray for other people. That's something we should do. Jesus is going to pray for specific groups of people. It's okay to say, you know what, I'm going to pray for this person or this group. And so as Jesus prays, we'll see him move through, and he's actually even going to pray for us near the end of this time. He says in, or in verse 1, John says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. This is the, the end of Jesus' instruction. And now he turns toward a time of prayer, and he adopts a very Jewish position of prayer. You know, oftentimes we teach our children to, to bow their heads when they pray, perhaps even to close their eyes, to fold their hands. We have different things we do as, as part of our time of prayer. But in Jesus's day, lifting up your eyes to heaven was a posture of prayer. Remember in the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee looked up to heaven to pray and the tax collector prayed, but it said that he was unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. He couldn't bring himself to do that. That was the traditional posture of prayer. So Jesus, with, with this one movement, as he lifts his eyes to heaven, that would have been everybody's cue that Jesus was about to pray. And he says, Father, Jesus in his prayers refers to God as his Father. There is a relationship there, and, and we'll see that throughout the prayer. And he says, Father, the hour has come. So far we've read several times that the hour has not yet come. But Jesus now acknowledges that the hour has come, and he acknowledges God's sovereignty in this to say this is God's timing. The hour has come. And his prayer is, glorify your son. And that, that may sound very selfish, you know, give me all the glory. But as you read through this, you know exactly what Jesus is talking about. His prayer, glorify your son, really is your will be done. Because Jesus is saying, I, I know what this takes. I know what it will mean. This is not a prayer of self-interest. He says, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. Jesus has said since the beginning, I came to do my father's will. And now as we come to the cross, to this final moments of Jesus' life on earth, he, he is making that last commitment. The cross is to be the vehicle of the glory that Jesus is looking to bring to the Father. And he prays that he may accept what is to come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. Verse 2 says, As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Jesus knows that he's on a mission that he's been given a mission and he's been given authority to carry out that mission. His authority is over all flesh. There is a, a, an implicit statement here that Jesus understands his role. John will say it in John 3.16, God so loved the world. But here he says, I've been given authority over all flesh. What Jesus does, he does for the human race. It is for all people, and he will grant eternal life to as many as you have given him. There, there is a, 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 an aspect here of eternal life, the offer of eternal life that's made to everyone. The whole world, all people, all flesh can have eternal life. Jesus does qualify that. 
it, it is interesting here. He says, you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many. All flesh there refers to everyone. It's kind of a group word. But as many refers to each individual. And so Jesus looks at salvation and he says salvation is offered to all people, to everyone, to the whole world. But it's taken by those, by as many as the Lord has given. That there, that it's also an individual thing. So Jesus affirms that salvation is both universal and individual at once. And he says, as many as you have given him, and some folks have seen some predestination there as if God had a list of people and he said, here's who's going to be saved, Jesus. And everybody whose name wasn't on that list didn't get saved. That Somehow God chose who would be saved and gave them salvation completely apart from their human will. As we go through what Jesus prays here, it's going to be clear that's not what he means. God does not somehow overpower them and compel them to be Christians and force them in some kind of robotic obedience to do the right thing. In fact, in just a few verses, Jesus is going to say, the ones you've given me are the ones who have kept your word. There's a choice that they have to make. In verse 3, he says, and this is eternal life. He said, I'm going to give eternal life. Here's eternal life. What does eternal life mean? Maybe that's something we ought to consider. What, what is eternal life? What are you looking forward to in eternal life? Is it eternal life in heaven? Is it a life with God now? Where? What is eternal life? Jesus says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus says eternal life is not about a, a type of living or even a place of living. It's about who you know. It's a relationship. Eternal life consists in the knowledge of the only true God. To, to have eternal life, the ultimate thing that we look forward to in heaven, is not the streets of gold. It's not even all the saints throughout all the ages. It is the presence of God. To know the only true God. To know Jesus, the one sent by God. It involves a personal relationship. In the Old Testament, to know someone in this sense well, it was often used to describe a deep relationship. It's not just I'm familiar with your name. But, but it is we are friends. We are close and here John has Jesus say that, that eternal life really is knowing God and knowing Jesus. The verb there is a, a present subjunctive. That means to keep on knowing. This is an ongoing relationship. It's not just learning about God and his ways. It is a walking with him. It means to live in a reverent, believing, and loyal relationship to him. Jesus says in verse 4, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. What a great statement there. More than ever, Jesus becoming flesh revealed the very nature of God. Jesus came, he said, I glorified you on earth. When Jesus showed up, he was God in the flesh. And he said he'd come to do the will of the one who had sent him. And he said, I've done that. By his life on earth, by his ministry, Jesus pointed people back to God. And his work on earth was to be accomplished finally at the cross. And Jesus knows that time is at hand, and he is so committed to that that he can speak of it in the past tense. He, he can say, I have finished the work which you've given me to do. It's on the cross just as he dies that he will declare it is finished. But he can now look ahead to that moment, and he knows. He knows that he will be faithful to that end. And so he says in verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In this part of the prayer, Jesus is talking to God the Father, and we're invited to listen in. And in, and in verse 5 there, he specifically says to, to glorify me, but this is looking forward to something even more than just what's going to happen on the cross. But glorify me uh, together with yourself. Let's both be glorified. What happens to one happens to the other. And he says, do that with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus acknowledges that he existed before he was born, before even the world cr was created. And he also acknowledges that, that what he had was something that he gave up when he came to earth. When he left heaven, there was a glory that he left behind, and he looked forward to returning to that. Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory I had before you, or with you before the world was. When Jesus is finally exalted to the right hand of the throne of God, he'll be returned to that place of glory. Jesus' incarnation required him to lay aside some of that glory, and he will reclaim that glory. 
So he says in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Jesus says, part of his job, he says, I, I have manifested, I have shown them your name. I have let them see you. To see Jesus was to see God. Remember whenever the apostles were there and they, they said, Lord, show us the Father and this will be enough. He says, I, I've been with you. You've, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've manifested your name. And again, the idea of the name was really the identity of the person. I've shown them you. I've shown you, I've shown them you, the men you gave me out of the world. Jesus said earlier, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And now he says, God gave you to me. And so he says that they belong to God. We're going to see that all people belong to God. And he says, you've given me these men and they've kept your word. Jesus said he chose them. He's going to say he chose them out of the world. You gave, you've given me them out of the world. They, they were part of the world that came out of the world. Jesus draws this distinction between his disciples and the rest of the world. That's going to continue throughout the New Testament. The church and the world. Well, the church is in the world, but it is not of the world. The disciples were, taken, were, were chosen out of the world. And he says, they were yours, but you gave them to me. And he says, they've kept your word. Jesus prays for them because they've kept the word of the Father. He had commanded his disciples, keep my word. And here he said they've kept God's word. And the idea of keeping God's word refers to everything that God has asked of them. Jesus said they've done everything you've asked. They've kept your word. Verse 7, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. So as Jesus prays, he says they, they've known. They have come to know, literally. Earlier, the disciples thought they had finally figured everything out. And Jesus let them know they still had more to learn. And yet Jesus can look into their lives and he knows they will come to know everything that they need to know. He says, they have known that uh, all things which you have given me are from you. What the disciples were beginning to understand, what they were coming to know, was the full relationship of Jesus with God, his Father. And so Jesus prays that they would understand him and prays that God would bless them because they have come to understand his relationship. And then he goes on and he says, For I have given to them the words which you have given me. What a great gift that Jesus gives. The gift that he gives is not a blessing of finance, uh, financial means or of power, but it's the word of God. It's the best gift that Jesus could give. I have given to them the words which you've given me. And, he says, they've received them. Jesus said, I gave this to them. I, they, they recognized the word as authoritative. And they received it. You see, you have a choice to make as well. God gives his word, but we have to choose to receive it. And he says, I've given to them the words which you have given me. And they've received them. And have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. They finally have known. They, they have understood Jesus uses the word truly here to say, you know, they, they've given, they, they've really come to believe this. They, they've finally come to understand that Jesus came from God. You know, we've talked about this before, but for us, oftentimes we struggle to see Jesus as human. We read about him in the Bible. We know him as the son of God. And, and it feels like when Jesus faces things, we, we know he's the son of God. And so he, he gets the Jesus edge. And yet for those disciples in the first century, it was just the opposite. They could look at the man in front of them. He looked just like them. They knew where he came from. They knew his family. To believe he was the son of God was hard. To believe he was a man was obvious. But Jesus says they've come to believe that you sent me. They've come to know that I came forth from you. They've realized that Jesus was God in the flesh and that he was there on a mission from God. And so Jesus now says in verse 9, I pray for them. You know, sometimes we use that language in our prayers as well. Lord, we pray for this person and we pray for that person. That's biblical. Jesus says, I pray for them. Your Bible might say, I ask. It's the, the verb erotao. And, and it literally has that idea, I make a request. But to make a request to God is to be done in prayer. So Jesus says, I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. The prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples was different from what he would pray for the world. He says, I, I don't pray this for the world. I don't pray that you would save the world in its worldliness. 
I don't ask this on behalf of the world. It doesn't mean he was not unconcerned for the world, but, but it simply means this prayer was for his disciples. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 10, and all mine are yours and yours are mine. Jesus, again, has this idea that, that he and God are one, and he puts that on display in this prayer. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Jesus understood that the mission he'd been given to glorify God was about to be given over to the disciples. And, and so they would glorify him and glorify God. The disciples belong to the Father. Jesus has already said, they're yours. But now he says, they've glorified you. I've been glorified through them. Their faith, shallow as it was at times, confused as it was at times, was enough. And it would see them through. And so Jesus said, I pray for them. I pray for them because they glorify, because I'm glorified in them. He understood that the church, the responsibility for establishing the church would fall to these men. And he said, verse 11, now I am no longer in the world. Jesus, of course, was still in the world at this point. He's looking ahead. And these actions are so certain that he can pray for them as if they've already happened. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. So Jesus says, I I'm going to be with you and they're going to still be in the world. And he says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Jesus says, I ask you to keep them. He says, I ask you to keep them and help them to be one. He uses the phrase Holy Father, which, by the way, is the only time in John's gospel that this phrase is used. It combines two notions, one of that eminence and transcendency, you are holy, and the other very personal, you are Father. It combines them together, and Jesus is teaching about God had always done that, and here he says, Holy Father, keep through your name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. The sign that the disciples were part of God, that they were, were part of the people of God, was their unity, their love for one another. As the church grew, it would be that same unity that marked them as the church of God. And so Jesus prays that they would be one. We'll see him continue that prayer as he continues to pray on behalf of his disciples, and eventually even for us. We'll pick up in verse 12 next week as we continue our study of John 17 and finish up this prayer. As we come to the end of, of this specific section, it is appropriate to kind of just stop and look and say, you know, here is eternal life to know God and to know Jesus. And we look forward to that for all eternity. It is the greatest thing that could ever happen to us to have the opportunity to know God and to know him through his son, Jesus Christ. That knowledge requires an obedience on our part. There, there's a life that is to be lived. And Jesus knows that, that we live in this world even while he is no longer physically present with us. And so just as he prays for his disciples, he's going to pray for us and our faith during that time that it would grow. I hope that's a blessing to you. I thank you for joining us for our Bible study this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer. Oh God, our Father, you sent your Son into this world to live a perfect and sinless life. He showed us you. To know Jesus is to know you. To have seen Jesus is to see you. So God, as we study what Jesus did on this earth, as we study his ministry, we pray that we would come to know you better. Thank you for that great blessing, that you are not hidden from us, that you have revealed yourself and your will to us. Thank you for your word. We pray you'll bless us as we study. Guide us and go with us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.